welcome back uh, to the corrosion failures and analysis. Today we have uh, lecture 18 and our discussion point will be today we will conclude the discussion on dealloying or uh, selective bleaching and then we will begin discussion on another corrosion form which is called intergranular corrosion. So, course is called So, uh, and the second topic we will start today is uh, intergranular corrosion. Now, if you recall our previous lecture, uh, lecture 17, we started talking about uh, some of the examples uh, what we have seen in case of silver cob silver zinc system. We have seen the example in case of uh, nickel zinc system, in case of silver zinc system we could get pure silver network uh, starting from uh, very lean silver contained in a silver lean composition, uh, silver 25 uh, zinc 75 alloy composition. And similarly, we have uh, um, seen uh, formation of zinc oxide nanorods on top of nickel core uh, by doing dealloying. Uh, of nickel zinc alloy, okay. that alloy was made by power powder metallurgy route which is uh, ball milling and mechanical alloying starting with a elemental powder nickel and zinc and then we dealloyed in 0.5 mole normal uh, Na weight solution fine. and we could get uh, uh, zinc oxide nano rods on top of nickel core. So, uh, and then we we'll started looking at dealloying in other systems. So, one system is such uh, in, in steel, which is a very popular system. Uh, uh, here we could see that uh, in case of uh, 100 percent perlite microstructure, uh, we could we could make uh, uh, we could separate out cementite plates by doing forceful polarization, where dealloying of pure iron or ferrite takes place and goes into the solution leaving behind cementite. Okay. So, here though it this is not a typical of pure elements rather one element is pure almost a pure form, but other cementite which is uh, basically a compound we can be considered as a single melting point compound. So, we can uh, assume to be a kind of single entity or single uh, 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 since it is it is a basically stoichiometric compound fine. So, there cementite stays back and uh, ferrite goes out. Similarly, in case of spheroidal iron where uh, spheroids of cementite stays back and iron goes out in the form of iron ions into the solution. So, their the dealloying takes place in the ferrite, okay, the ferrite goes out. And uh, both the examples I could cite for because we have worked on that particular field in the lab. So, this is a typical uh, example of uh, galvanic corrosion, but that galvanic cor corrosion leads to a selective dissolution. Here you can say that it is selective leaching. So, let us get back to that particular example. For example, here, so this selective leaching of selective leaching of ferrite takes place. or dealing of ferrite express. Similarly, another example we saw uh, in case of spheroidal uh, steel where uh, initially it was pyrolytic steel and then it was converted into spheroids by doing heat treatment which is called a spheroidal heat treatment. And then uh, we could see that preferential dissolution of uh, uh, iron or ferrite leaves behind the spheroids of free standing spheroids of cementite. Okay, so, this is these are the examples. So, please go back and look at the look at lecture 17 to understand these two pictures. Okay. So, now another picture and this is the reference if you want to see that reference this is the reference. 
which uh, is basically work uh, we have done at IIT Kanpur. Right? Now, uh, this is another example where uh, uh, 0.43 percent, the carbon content is 0.43 percent carbon. So, there we have ferrite as well as pearlite. Okay? So, this is the ferrite part, this is the pearlite and this is this microstructure is obtained by etching in nickel. Fine. Now, uh, uh, there we have two phases, one, it, one is ferrite grains, another one is uh, pearlite colony. See, pearlite cannot be mentioned as a phase because it is a phase mixture. We have both the phases, one is cementite, one is ferrite. So, that is what it is called pearlitic, mix, pearlitic colony. Now, this pyrite grain and uh, uh, pearlite colony, uh, this particular microstructure we developed by nitrile etching. But now, if we start with anit sample, polys and anit sample, that if we do again a polarization, so again the polarization is done and those polarizations are done in NaCl solution, 3.5 percent NaCl solution. And in fact, here also it is done, this polarization is done 3.5 weight percent in SEL solution. Similarly, this is also done in 3.5 percent in SEL solution okay. and this is freely aerated that means, it is exposed to open atmosphere. Now, uh, here uh, why I am showing this picture, this actually also combines both the galvanic effect as well as the alloy. Let us see that, that is what I thought that let us, let me discuss this particular picture. Now, this is a micrograph which is developed after polarization. So, this is a kind of polarization we got at a very high value of polarization we got okay, uh, to the anodic part and after that we took the microstructure. Remember after polarization we have not done any etching, this particular picture has formed due to selective dissolution of ferrite. Okay. Now, interestingly, cementite is all the time, cementite and ferrite, this couple is considered, if this couple is considered, then this will act as anode and this will act as cathode. This happens in, this particular situation happens in case of pearlite colony. Okay. Now, if you take pearlite and and ferrite grain, so this is this is one grain, this is one grain of ferrite, this is another grain of ferrite this is another grain of ferrite okay, or we call it alpha iron and this is the pearlite colony. So, this part is basically pearlite colony and this is you can say that this is almost a single pearlite colony because all the part, the lamellar orientation is similar in one direction, all are in this direction. Okay. So, that is why it is a single colony. Now, in the pearlite, co pearlite colony, we have ferrite lamella and ferrite cementite lamella. So, the cementite acts as cathode and ferrite acts as anode. But when we talk about ferrite grain and pearlite colony, pearlite colony since it has a lot of cementite and cementite is cathodic in nature, overall it will act as a cathode. and this is anode. And now, anode would dissolve as per the galvanic effect in this particular solution. Now, question is when this dissolves, the dissolution effect will be seen adjacent to where thus this pearlite and anode, pearlite and ferrite gains are in contacts. So, the dissolution pattern will be seen around this zone. around this zone. In fact, we have seen this particular effect by doing a AFM image, where it is very clear that if we see the depth profile, 
here the depth is very high and then it will become like this. So, the pearlite this is the pearlite depth and this is in the contact point region the depth has gone back this is on the same level, but in the area where pearlite colony and ferrite grains are in contact there we have good amount of the dissolution has happened quite a good distance and then gradually the distance has gone up and then finally, the ferrite grain again becomes almost at the same level as pearlite, pearlite, pearlite level. Because here we have in this particular region we have galvanic effect, it also relates to the point that we talked about in galvanic corrosion that contact point is the most vulnerable region where corrosion of ferrite or corrosion of no active metal happens at a rapid rate compared to the place little away from the galvanic contact point. So, this is the galvanic contact point where pearlite colony acts as cathode and ferrite grain acts as anode. So, that is what you have dissolution of ferrite close to that contact and then as you go away from the contact point the dissolution depth decreases gradually and finally, it becomes almost at the same level as a pearlite level. Okay. So, that means, this is that is what I wanted to bring in this particular picture. Again if you want to see this particular paper you can see this, this is also our work. Now, this happens between pearlite colony and ferrite, ferrite grain, but in the pearlite colony we have selective dissolution of the ferrite lamella leaving behind standalone cementite. You would see that the cementite, this cementite you see this is a kind of cementite plate, that cementite plate has bent because gradually you are taking away, away ferrite in the form of iron ions into the solution leaving behind those cementite plates, standalone cementite plates. That happens because of this effect. Okay, where cementite lamellae acts as cathode, ferrite lamellae acts as anode and the anode dissolution takes place and here anode is nothing but almost pure iron. Okay. So, this is a kind of mixed, uh, is a combination of uh, dealloying in the pearlite and galvanic effect between pearlite colony and ferrite. So, this is a classic uh, combination, the combination uh, modes, combination mode. Okay. So, now let me talk about let me talk about uh, uh, graphitization. Okay. So, this is an, an example uh, let us put or we call, call it graphitic corrosion. So, this happens in cast iron. So, some book it is written as graphitization. Okay. So, this I, I think this is my personal opinion that this should not be used while talking about uh, corrosion of cast iron. Okay. Graphitization means formation of graphite during cooling stage of a cast iron. Okay. So, that time uh, uh, if we see uh, iron carbon phase diagram. This is a schematic picture you can say I am not putting all those specific values, but in schematically it is a basically this is called a peritectic. Okay. So, this is eutectoid and this is eutectic points.
and these are the different phases are this is liquid iron, this is delta plus liquid, this is delta region, this is delta plus gamma, this is gamma, this is alpha region, this is alpha plus gamma, this is alpha plus Fe 3 C and here we have gamma plus Fe 3 C okay. and this is weight percent weight percent of carbon fine and uh, this is temperature. You can go to some of the books usual physical metallurgy book you will get this diagram. Now, up to this point we call it this is around 2 percent and this is 4.3 percent carbon. Okay. So, this 4.3 percent carbon so between this to this we have cast iron zone and there from here let us say you are here. Okay. So, from there if you do a slow cooling depending on the cooling rate either you get cementite austenite. If you do a slow cooling you will get graphite ferrite and if you have a little higher cooling you can get graphite as well as pearlite. pearlite. So, those are the kind of microstructures you will get, but one such microstructure so, there are different steels called different cast irons, white cast iron, grey cast iron, then uh, SG cast iron which is spheroidal graphite cast iron, cast iron then we have malleable cast iron. Now, if I see uh, the cast iron that is forming in case of grey cast iron, if it is a ferritic grey cast iron or pearlitic grey cast iron. So, microstructure could be you have those grains, ferrite grains or there could be a possibility of pearlite, okay, some pearlite presence should be there and those graphites are actually basically in the form of flakes. So, these are graphites. these are the graphites, these are in the flake form. Here what happens cementite breaks and then form iron and so this is cementite Fe 3 C breaks and form iron plus carbon and this carbon is nothing but graphite. Okay. Now, here also there could be a possibility of preferential dissolution of ferrite which is nothing but ferrite and the ferrite can dissolve leaving behind graphite in the matrix. Okay. So, now if the ferrite dissolves because in this particular case this acts as anode this acts as cathode. So, this anode cathode that means anode should dissolve cathode would stay back. Since the graphite is actually basically having a kind of flaky arrangement and once the one layer of iron dissolves this graphite can have interlocking between them. So, if you see from a cross section point of view. this cross section. So, if you see this part, so this part there would be individual graphites. So, these graphites will have interlocking between them. The top surface if you uh, uh, see a polished grey cast iron, this is a grey cast iron. So, it will look shiny. Okay. Though there would be in, if you compare with the steel polished surface scratch less polished surface and grey cast iron scratch less polished surface. In the grey cast iron polished surface you might see a little bit of greyish nature not very shining as you see in case of 
uh, steel case in case of carbon steel because of the graphite presence fine. Now, if you start with that polished surface the shiny nature is almost lost and the surface would become very much gray color okay. and that gray color if you take this surface and then rub on a white paper it just gives you the uh, kind of appearance or the mark which should you should get by having a, a pencil rubbing against a white paper. So, this is nothing but the graphite. Okay. Now, if you take a spheroidal cast iron S G cast iron. So, there this similar effect can happen. So, there the microstructure is. So, these are let us say a ferritic uh, matrix or little bit of perlite is also there. There the graphites are in the form of spheroids. And interestingly around that spheroid if it is a politic uh, S G iron then you will see that around that there is a white layer. The white layer and those white layers are nothing but uh, a pure iron or ferrite because while graphite forms surrounding that area it actually takes, uh, takes carbon and forms graphite. Okay, the cementite breaks and then that is what that around that area becomes whitish. So, that is not our discussion point, but now if we have the dialing in this case where the similar this graphite spheroids and ferrite this one and this one it will act as anode and it will act as cathode since in the galvanic series this is having higher potential in a solution in a normal solution or acid solution this will be acting as a cathode. So, now there this dissolves preferentially because of the galvanic effect and then leaving behind graphite spheroids. Okay. So, but since these are not interconnected here if you see it is basically if you see under three dimensional picture. So, let us say this is the layer I am talking about. This is the layer I am talking about the spheroids are actually not having any interconnection. So, because of not having any interconnection as the layer disappears due to dealloying or the ferrite dissolution this graphite this graphite spheroids will fall off from the surface and it will if you do it in a beaker if you do it in a beaker you will see that at the bottom some small small black stuff have stuffs have collected have been collected okay so this collection of black stuff you will see so these are nothing but graphite particles and this happens because in this case those spheroids are not having interlocking. So, that is what they it is very easy to fall off rather than in case of graphitic case where, where in case of gray cast iron where graphites are flaky. So, that is what they have interconnection. So, they do not like to leave the surface. So, but mechanism wise both are same. So, this is one particular corrosion mode which we will call it graphitic corrosion. So, this is also falling under uh, de-alloying process, but here you see interestingly in case of zinc copper system we could see that copper redeposits back in case of silver cause zinc system silver redeposits back in case of you can go to the literature and search silver copper silver system okay. in case of sorry in case of copper uh, gold silver system silver di dissolves gold stays back. So, that is what you have fantastic network of pure gold uh, porous structure. Okay. So, there what happens both dissolves first and then uh, pure uh, this uh, noble metal deposits back. 
in case of copper zinc copper deposit pack in case of silver zinc silver deposit pack. So, there we see that the preferentially both dissolve and then one pure uh, one noble metal noble ion deposit pack, but in this case we do not have dissolution of both rather one dissolves and the second one is left behind. So, in this graphitic iron or in the steel corrosion what we have seen there the mechanism the first mechanism which says that uh, active metal dissolves and the noble stuff stays back that particular concept is valid here. Okay. Now, coming to uh, some of the protections what we can have in case of zinc brass system we can use protection from dejinkification protection from dejinkification one is we can have copper enrich copper enrich brass say a zinc could be around 15 percent, we can reduce de alloying to a great extent. Second, we can add little bit of tin or arsenic, okay. arsenic. So, what it does around 0.1 percent or around close to 1 percent arsenic, if you would add there, they actually deposit back and then prevent redeposition of copper ion though first layer dissolves, but after that silver arsenic deposit redeposit back. So, that it does not allow copper to redeposit back. So, one step is broken. So, whenever we have a step reaction, so what happens here the step reactions happen copper zinc dissolves fine and then copper redeposit back. So, the next step this is stage 1 second stage is copper plus 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 2 electron minus 2 e minus 2 e it deposits back redeposits back. So, this is you can say stage 2. So, now if this is broken then the first step cannot go on. Okay. So, that time and of course, th that time Say zinc stays there in the solution and we have dejinkification, but this arsenic what it does it forms a layer on top of copper zinc alloy and then it does not allow the second react second stage to happen. So, that is what it is protected. Okay. We can have uh, for example, one such diagram and coming to this particular effect one can see the study that temperature and depth. Okay, so, some of the metals that like for example, Munch metal which has uh, uh, around 40 percent zinc, then one can have which is alpha beta brass. So, then one can have uh, naval bronze which is around 39.2 percent zinc and 0 0.08 percent tin. So, I said that this is around 0 0.1 percent addition okay. and then red brass which is around uh, uh, 5 percent zinc, 5 percent tin and then 5 percent lead. So, this one if you see as the temperature increases the depth of attack or the depth of dejinkification is very low in case of red zinc, because here the zinc is very low 5 percent and rest of the thing is copper all the cases fine. So, that is the advantage of having even in case of for example, if you compare these two uh, only little bit of uh, uh, this is tin okay. only little bit of addition of tin has prevented the dejinkification to a great extent. Okay, because you see here it was 40 percent zinc and here 39.2 the rest of the thing is copper and 0 0.08 percent tin which is 0.1 percent tin. So, it prevents the dejinkification fine. So, that is another protection 
and then uh, 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 another route is in case if you have a very aggressive solution, it is better not to use brass rather than use a copper nickel system. Okay. Uh, uh, so, they are cupri nickel can be utilized, this is called cupri nickel or cupro nickel. So, this is cupri nickel which is uh, close to 70 to 90 percent copper and rest is nickel 30 to 10 percent nickel. So, this is an alloy one can use in case of aggressive solution where dejinctification cannot be avoided. So, these are some of the protection routes uh, one can use. Okay. So, uh, uh, let me end the dejinctification because uh, I have given lot of examples, examples from the lab, examples from the uh, 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 from uh, uh, actual practical situation where the brass pipe example we have we have talked about. Uh, we will talk about uh, intergranular corrosion from the next lecture onwards. Thank you.